So last time we introduced stereoisomers or perhaps reintroduced stereoisomers just as a chance to talk about properties of stereoisomers, how we quantify enantiomers, differences between enantiomers, diastereomers, racemates, and meso compounds. In a way, you could say that's all sort of review. I'd like to take things to a, a bit of a higher level today and talk about what we'll call concepts in stereochemistry. And what I love about stereochemistry is it is so conceptual, it is so visual, it involves thinking and understanding three-dimensional shapes of molecules. And it's helpful to have some terms and some concepts in order to really think about what's going on. And today I'd like to introduce the idea of topism, the idea of how two groups that can still be the same type of group can be different in various ways, diastereotopic and antiotopic, I'll explain what I mean, uh, on a tetrahedral carbon, and also how two faces of a sp2 carbon, of a planar carbon, can themselves be prochiral and can lead to opposite handedness when you form a bond to that carbon. And that's going to take us into our third lecture on stereochemistry, which is stereoselective reactions. So let me, by way of example, introduce this idea of topism, the idea that two different groups attached to a tetrahedral carbon can be the same or can be different in various ways. And so the groups that I'll, the molecule that I'll introduce for starters, I think it's a nice starting point, is the molecule phenylalanine. It's an amino acid, as I think many of you know. And I'll draw it out in a particular way. And we're going to focus on the two hydrogens on the beta carbon, the two hydrogens on the CH two carbon here on the sp3 carbon. And we know that this carbon itself is not a stereogenic center. The carbon adjacent to it, the alpha carbon, is a stereocenter. We have three different, four different substituents on the carbon. If we had to assign stereochemistry, we'd assign S to this stereocenter here. But we'd say, oh, these two hydrogens, we have a carbon with three different things on it, not four. This is not a stereogenic center. So nevertheless, these two hydrogens are different. And they're different in a way that, for example, they show up as two sets of peaks in the NMR spectrum. So I'll sort of circle them and say, show up as two sets of peaks in the NMR spectrum usually those peaks will be at different positions and you'll see a pattern that looks something like this you'll see a line 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 for one, and then for the other you'll see the same pattern, maybe with a slightly different arrangement, maybe line, 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 line. Each of these peaks has a name, each of these is called a doublet of doublets. But what I want to focus on is not the splitting pattern here. So this is the 1H NMR spectrum. I'll just add that. What I want to focus is not on the splitting pattern, but that these hydrogens are somehow different. They're in a different magnetic environment. And you can say, oh, well, I can kind of see that. One hydrogen, as we've drawn it, is sort of on the same side as the NH2. The other is opposite. I see they are somehow different. I'll juxtapose that with phenylacetic acid. 
or phenylpropionic acid, 3-phenylpropionic acid. And we'll look at the hydrogens in the analogous position, and I'll circle those hydrogens. And those hydrogens show up as just one set of peaks, or show up as one, yeah, I'll say show up as one set of peaks. in the H1 NMR spectrum. And you probably know or remember from sophomore organic chemistry what these, the peaks associated with this hydrogen should look like. What would you expect for this? A triplet. A triplet. They, it would look something like this. A one to two to one triplet T or triplet is how people would describe it. And you'd say, well, okay, these two hydrogens are somehow the same as each other. These two hydrogens are somehow different from each other. And we can describe a name for the difference of the two beta hydrogens in phenylalanine we would say that these two hydrogens are what I would call, and I'm gonna, oh, I'll capitalize it, what the heck. If you're just writing a word, of course you wouldn't, but I'm sort of writing it as a, a title. These two hydrogens are diastereotopic. Diastereotopic means that the two groups differ in a way that if you were to replace one or the other, or just do it as a thought experiment, you would generate diastereomers. So I'll say two groups that are diastereotopic differ in that replacement of one or the other with uh, deuterium or something, let's just say, for example, e.g. with deuterium. Deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. That would generate diastereomers. So if I carry out that thought experiment with phenylalanine, and we do that, and I replace one with a deuterium, and I do that same experiment, and I replace the other with deuterium. And we look at these two molecules and compare them. These two molecules are diastereomers. In other words, one molecule you look at, you say, oh, at the two position we have an S stereocenter. And at the three position, okay, remember the rules for Conningold prelog. Hydrogen, you count by atomic number, so we have a carbon, right? A phenyl group is a benzene ring, so that phenyl means we have a benzene ring over there. So we have two carbons attached here. We have a carbon with a nitrogen attached here. We have a deuterium. So the ranking is one, two, three. This would be an R center, right? You rank by first atomic number, 
Second, you go out into what's attached to it. In the ranking one, nitrogen beats carbon. The ranking one wins out. And then within the same atomic number, hydrogen versus deuterium, they're both atomic number one, but the heavier element, deuterium, has a proton and a neutron and a mass number of two. Hydrogen has just a proton and a mass number of one, so it outranks it. This molecule still has an S stereocenter here, but now your ranking is, whoops, did I do this right? Let's see, one, two, three, R, one, two, three, S. So yeah, so we have diastereomers here. Does that make sense? I'll just write this as R. And of course, you can see this in your mind's eye. We've been talking about, am I right on this? Did I screw it up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thinking on my feet. All right, so let us contrast it to these two protons. So these two protons here we say are diastereotopic. These two protons are what we would say is enantiotopic. And enantiotopic means that two groups differ only in that if you replace one or the other, now you get enantiomers. For example, the same thought experiment where we replace with deuterium. We'll do for the phenyl propionic acid. And these two molecules are enantiomers of each other. So just coming back to this concept here, we see that even though neither of these methylene groups, neither the methylene group in phenylalanine nor the methylene group in phenylpropionic acid is itself a stereogenic center, those protons have different behaviors. They behave differently in the NMR. If we were to carry out a reaction with an achiral reagent, the achiral reagent would, let's say, uh, free radical bromination, for example, the achiral reagent would not be able to distinguish between these two. In other words, a reaction with the two enantiotopic protons would generate an equal amount of reaction at one versus at the other, but an achiral reagent would react differently, say at a different rate, maybe slightly different, maybe greatly different, with the two diastereotopic protons because they are in different environments. Does that make sense? There's one more type of topism which I haven't drawn out. It's the most boring. It's where the protons are completely the same. So if we had, for example, um, let's say, just we'll take uh, diphenylmethane as an example. 
The two hydrogens in diphenylmethane are not diastereotopic. They're not enantiotopic. In other words, if I replace one with deuterium, you get the exact same molecule as if I replace the other. They are what we call homotopic. Thoughts or questions at this point? All right, so continuing with this idea of concepts, if we come to these, these enantiotopic protons, there's a special term that we can refer to them. The enantiotopic protons are said, or the enantiotopic are attached, let's say, to a carbon that we would describe as prochiral. In other words, that carbon to which they're attached is not chiral in its own right, but if we were to go ahead and replace one or the other, we would get a chiral center. And we can go and we can use these same rules of Kahn-Ingold prelog to define the protons. We would describe the hydrogen that if we replaced with a deuterium would generate an S stereocenter. We would Decide, we would describe this as a pro-S proton. So we would say the, the protons are attached to a prochiral center. And we define this as a pro-S and this one as pro-R. In other words, if we elevate its rank, if we, if we go ahead and make it a deuterium, our order in this case becomes one, two, one, two, three, and that becomes S. And if we were to replace this hydrogen with the deuterium, it would be the reverse, and that would be R. So just to write this out, the hydrogen that would give an S stereocenter is called pro-S. And the hydrogen that we give in our stereocenter is called pro-R. Questions? Yeah. So um, for every uh, type of hydrogen like that, uh, like an enantiotopic or an estereotopic, are they all, do they all react differently? And then, so enantiotopic hydrogens react 
differently with a chiral reagent, but not with an achiral reagent, very much like my hands um, will grab an achiral object in the same way. This is a horrible analogy. Let's see if I can, can better explain it. Enantiotopic Yeah, I guess when, bad analogy, so let's, yeah, enantiotopic protons react identically with an achiral reagent, but do not react identically with a chiral reagent. Diastereotopic protons react differently or can react differently even with an achiral reagent. Other thoughts and questions? Yeah. Uh, with the carbon next to what we call the prochiral carbon, would that also be prochiral? Yes, it would be. <coughs> so this carbon as well is prochiral because we have two different substituents on it. Or to put it another way, because if we carry out the same thought experiment and replace one hydrogen or the other hydrogen, we get a chiral center. Other thoughts? So it's not, it's not just hydrogens, of course, that can be prochiral. And so let me give you an example of two methyl groups and also give an example of a chiral reagent, or perhaps I should say a way of differentiating them. So as I mentioned earlier on, it's very valuable to be able to create single enantiomers because single enantiomers are building blocks often for making more complex chiral structures like drugs. Or to put it another way, if you're building up a molecule with many stereocenters, in order to get each stereocenter right, you have to bring in the right components. In other words, if I had a molecule with six stereocenters and I formed each of those stereocenters randomly, I would get two to the fifth diastereomers or two to the six stereoisomers, which would include enantiomers. So having this element of control is really important. So taking achiral materials and converting them into chiral materials is incredibly valuable. So let's take an example of how this can be done, and I think it also shows off nicely the idea that other groups other than hydrogen can also lead to prochiral centers. So let's take isobutyric acid. Now I'm going to draw it like this for a moment. If we take isobutyric acid and allow a bacteria called Pseudomonas putridis to munch on it, Under the correct conditions, the enzymes in the bacteria oxidize one of the methyl groups selectively. And so we oxidize, we hydroxylate one of the methyl groups preferentially, and being that biological enzymes, being that, that enzymes in biological systems are usually highly, highly stereoselective. We oxidize exclusively one of the two prochiral methyl groups. So in other words, this center is prochiral, and we have, I guess we would say, enantiotopic methyl groups. And so we get 100% EE, remember 100% enantiomeric excess means we have 100% of one enantiomer, 0% of 
another enantiomer. So the enzymes in the bacteria are highly stereoselective, and we happen to get a 48% chemical yield. So when I was drawing out our hydrogens before, showing the prochiral centers in, say, phenylpropionic acid, I made a big effort to draw a wedge and a dash so you would see it. So if you need help seeing it, I could go ahead and say, all right, we can think of this as a say a wedge and a dash to remind us that that, methyl, that that carbon atom is tetrahedral, that the carbon atom bearing the two methyls and the hydrogens is tetrahedral. But also realize as organic chemists we keep a lot of stuff up here where we understand it and think about it and it all sort of runs in the background. So the average person who wrote isobutyric acid would probably write it like this. And yet embedded in this structure, embedded in the structure of isobutyric acid, embedded in the structure of 2-methylpropanoic acid, is the fact that you have a prochiral carbon and two diastereotopic methylene groups. And the fact that even though I haven't shown wedges and dashes, that carbon is still tetrahedral. And usually when I'm doing a thought experiment like we did with the deuterium and I'm looking at a molecule like this and saying, are these two methyl groups diastereotopic? Are they enantiotopic? Are they homotopic? Three possibilities. I will do a thought experiment where I replace one of them with a CD3 group or I replace the other with a CD3 group. And just as we asked, are the two molecules, when you replace it with deuterium, are they diastereomers, diastereotopic protons, enantiomers, enantiotopic protons, or the same homotopic protons? This same thought experiment here allows us to say, OK, the two methyl groups are enantiotopic. We generate enantiomers when we replace one or the other, and this is a prochiral center. Now, just as a group that itself is not chiral, a carbon that is not a chiral carbon but is sp3, can be prochiral, SP2, sp2 centers can also be prochiral, and they have enantiotopic faces. Let's consider acetophenone. And remember, acetophenone is just the phenyl group that I keep drawing in my examples is just the phenyl, is just a benzene ring. So let's consider acetophenone and let's imagine adding a nucleophile to it. You learned a lot about adding nucleophiles to ketones in sophomore organic chemistry. You learned about adding Grignard reagents. You learned about adding organolithium reagents. You learned about adding hydrogen cyanide to ketones. So we have some nucleophile. When that nucleophile adds, 
we are going to have it able to add from either the front face or from the back face, and unless that nucleophile is itself chiral, we will get an equal amount of those two additions. In other words, we will get an equal amount of these two enantiomers. So the two faces of the double bond are enantiotopic. The two faces of the sp2 center We have a special way of naming them just as we named our protons as pro-R and pro-S, we can use R being right and S being left, rectus and sinister. We can use a similar system of nomenclature for the, uh, the two faces, the two enantiotopic faces of the sp2 center. We can describe one as the C face and the other as the ray face. So I'm going to try my best to draw our acetophenone in perspective. So imagine for a moment that we have a plane here. So I'm sort of holding it like this. And we're looking down on that plane. We call this top face, we call it the C face. And we call this bottom face the ray face. And the way we define these faces is very much like the Conning-Gold Prelog rules you learned for sp3 centers. In other words, we look Down, we look at the molecule, and from this face, looking at it from this face, so it's this face over here, we assign priority. We assign top priority to the biggest atomic number. We assign next priority to the carbon that has more carbons attached to it, and we assign lowest priority to the carbon that has no other carbons attached to it, just a hydrogen attached to it. And when we go one, two, three, we go like that. That's counterclockwise. If it were an sp2, an sp3 center citing down the bond to that fourth priority substituent, we'd call it S. Here we call this the C face. I'll just write counterclockwise. And if you can imagine looking at the other face, so just picking it up and looking from underneath, now we would be going one, two, three. We'd be going clockwise. If you want help with that, I'll just pick it up and look at it from the other face, flip it over like so. One, two, three, and that's the ray face. Yeah? Are you able to just like, do like a mirror image, just flip it around? You can, you can do that. Now, this is a, the one reason I'll sort of be cautious on that is realize that if we had another stereocenter in the molecule, if I just, if I did a real mirror image, I'd invert that stereocenter. So what I'm doing is picking up this molecule and flipping it over. So coming back to say phenylalanine, the sp2 center of the carboxyl group is also 
a enantiotopic face. Actually, there it's diastereotopic because you get diastereomers. But there, if we were to assign ray and C, we would pick it up and you know, not just make the mirror image of the molecule because that would flip the stereocenter of phenylalanine. All right. So what this means is that addition of the nucleophile to the C face gives one enantiomer. Initial addition of the nucleophile to the ray face gives the other enantiomer. And that's a big and important concept. And where I want to go with that big and important concept is to some examples of the aldol reaction, which we'll play with today and in the next lecture. So let us start with a simple aldol reaction of acetophenone. And so I'll take, say, um, tert-butyl acetate as our nucleophile and make an enolate of it and add it to acetophenone. So we'll take, let's say, tert-butyl acetate. This is the same for those of you who had Chem 160. That's the same molecule we use in the first lecture in the first lab of Chem 160 in an aldol reaction. We go ahead and we treat it with LDA. And then in the case of the Chem 160 lab, we treat it with benzophenone, but I want to use acetophenone in this particular example. And then three, we carry out an aqueous workup with some sort of aqueous, mild aqueous acid. And the result is now that we get the aldol product. And that aldol product, we have two enantiomers of it in this particular case. We have the enantiomer where the methyl group has, uh, is on front. And we have the enantiomer where the methyl group is on back. So this is what we would call the racemic compound. In other words, we get an equal amount of both enantiomers. We get the racemate, just like we talked about, say, the racemate of tartaric acid not being optically active, having an equal amount of both enantiomers. So just by way of refreshment here, oops, what did I do with LDA there? Just by way of a refresher here, LDA is lithium diisopropyl amide. It is a strong base. LDA generates the lithium enolate. The lithium enolate reacts with the acetophenone to generate the aldolate. And after addition of aqueous acid, we generate the aldol product.
So, thoughts or comments? Questions? Yes. Ah, brilliant question. Couldn't we also, with the LDA, of gen deprotonated the acetophenone? Absolutely, which is why we carry out this reaction in steps. So in the first step, you go ahead and you take your flask, usually you'll use THF as a solvent, and you'll put some LDA in it. Or more specifically, you'll take diisopropylamine, which has a hydrogen here, and add some butyl lithium, which will pull off the proton and make LDA. In the first step, you will then go ahead and add terc-butyl acetate to the LDA. At that point, sitting in your pot is the lithium enolate. Now, in the second step, you'll add the acetophenone. And so this is what I love about this type of aldol reaction is you have this level of control. Often in sophomore organic chemistry, when they start to teach about the aldol reaction, they'll show an example where you throw everything together with some base. And then, yeah, you can generate different enolates. But the great thing about the lithium enolate aldol reaction is this element of control. I'm going to make this enolate, not that enolate. Then I'm going to add this electrophile and not that electrophile. So it's a very nice level of control. Other questions? These are good questions. These are important questions. All right. I want to play with this idea some more and bring us into the idea that we can get out diastereomers. So I'm going to now, instead of having a an ester component, a nucleophile component, that has a methyl group. I'll have a nucleophile component that has a methylene group. So let me take as an example tert-butyl propionate instead of tert-butyl acetate. And we'll carry out the same reaction. One, we'll treat it with LDA. Two, and I think just to make our drawing simpler, I'm going to show you with benzaldehyde. So I will show you with the benzaldehyde. It'll just make our drawing simpler. If you wanted to do the same reaction with acetophenone, you could. And three, we'll carry out an aqueous workup with some mild aqueous acid. Now we get four stereoisomers possible. In other words, our OH can be going forward or back. Our methyl group can be going forward or back. Four stereoisomers are possible. And I want to draw out those stereoisomers and talk about their relationship to each other. So let's draw them out explicitly. I'll start and permute the variations here. So we'll start, I'll draw the OH coming out of the blackboard. And I'll draw the methyl group coming out of the blackboard. I'll permute and draw the OH going back into the blackboard, the hydroxyl group going back into the blackboard and the methyl group going back into the blackboard. I'll permute again and have the OH coming out of the blackboard and the methyl group 
going back into it. And I'll flip those stereocenters, and we'll have the OH going back into it and the methyl group coming out. So what's the relationship between the stereoisomer on the upper left and the stereoisomer on the upper right? Enantiomers. And what's the relationship between the stereoisomer on the bottom left and the stereoisomer on the bottom right? Enantiomers, they're mirror images. If I want to see that quickly, I'll just reflect through the mirror plane, easiest way, reflect through the mirror plane of the blackboard. If I reflect through the mirror plane of the blackboard, this OH goes back and this methyl group comes out. And so I'm able to see, oh yeah, these two molecules are mirror images and they're non-superimposable. What about the relationship between the structure on the upper left and the structure on the lower left? So these two are diastereomers. And ditto these two as well. And if I want to complete all of the interrelationships, I can just fill in two more arrows and say the molecule on the bottom left is also a diastereomer of the molecule on the bottom right, and ditto for the top left and the bottom right. In other words, these are diastereomers as well. Thoughts or questions? So I want to conclude by setting, setting the stage for next lecture where we're going to start to take a look at stereoselectivity in the aldol reaction. And I want to set the concept that the enolates that are generated have stereochemistry, at least in the case of the propionate here, and that there are preferences that the enolate with the E stere the let's start with the Z stereochemistry prefers the synaldol. Oh yeah, let me also give us some names. So what we will refer to this diastereomer is the syn. Syn is just a way of saying the methyl group and hydroxy are on the same side as drawn. So this is a syn diastereomer. This is a syn diastereomer. where the methyl group and the hydroxy are on opposite sides, that's what we would call an anti-diastereomer. And where the methyl group and the hydroxy are on opposite sides, this is what we would call an anti-diastereomer. And so where I want to set the stage is that the Z-enolate prefers this forming the syn-aldol product. I'll say Z 
favors sin, and the E enolate leads to the anti I'll say E favors anti and I just want to draw these out here as a starting point for us to think about and that is that the enolate is itself a sort of alkene And we call this enolate the E enolate. Um, we call this enolate rather the Z enolate. And we call this enolate the E enolate. Oops. E, it means on opposite sides of the double bond. Z means on the same. And technically, if anybody's really counting, lithium is lower than carbon. So normally you would say, oh, this is higher priority. So technically, we call this the ZO enolate and the EO enolate. Basically, the Z enolate is the one with the enolate oxygen on the same side as the methyl group. The E enolate is the, meth the enolate with it on the opposite side, a trans relationship. All right, I want to drop that as a starting point for Friday's or Wednesday, no, Friday's lecture, and we will pick up talking about how and why that stereochemical preference that stereoselectivity occurs. See you on Friday.